I think it's working okay. Um, hello, is there any audio available? <laughs> Not yet. We'll get started in just a few seconds. <laughs> okay. Everyone's just being very quiet. Okay. Hey, Jim. How you doing? Hi. Nice to see you, as always. <laughs> yeah, I think maybe we can get started then. Um, okay. So I think we're at seminar 10. We've reached double digits. So thanks everyone for joining us for the last 10 weeks. Um, so I assume everyone knows by now, but if you want to ask questions, just type them in the chat. Or if you'd like to ask yourself, um, just write the word question, then we can call you on. Um, so today we've got two speakers. Um, our first speaker today is Matthias Krauss. 
Um, as a postdoc in the lab of Frank Gerler at MIT, Matthias works on the regulation of the actin cytoskeleton during fibroblast migration, uh, identifying the protein lamellopodin as a protein implicated in leading edge dynamics. And Matthias has since been a group leader at King's College London since 2004. Um, his lab aims to understand the mechanisms that regulate cytoskeletal remodeling during cell migration, including the melopodial dynamics, neuronal morphogenesis, and control of endocytosis. And today he'll be talking about how Nance Horan syndrome like one protein negatively regulates skull wave up two, three activity and inhibits the melopodial stability in cell migration. Okay, thank you very much for organizing such an amazing cell migration seminar series. So my lab is interested in understanding how cells can integrate extracellular signals in order to achieve proper directional migration. Directional migration is required for morphogenesis during embryonic development. Uh, so for example, neural neuron quest migration. Um, in other words, cell migration can make us Later on in life, cell migration is also required for wound healing and immune responses. But on the other hand, cell migration can also break us. Um, Upperhandly regulated cell migration can cause developmental defects and also can contribute to tumor invasion and metastasis. Cells can migrate using different modes. So for example, they can migrate as clusters as epithelial or endothelial cells collectively, or after undergoing EMT, they can migrate um, as uh, mesenchymal cells or also in an amoeboid mood. Um, for the remainder of the talk, we will focus on mesenchymal cell migration. And in this mode, cells are polarized with a distinct front and back. At, at the front, the extending membrane protrusion, which is called a lamnipodium. And underneath the lamnipodium, uh, adhesions with extracellular matrix form. And at the back of the cell, they are disassembled, allowing cell translocation to occur. And um, so these lamnipoda can be observed in two dimensions here in these live at GFP expressing the 6F1 melanoma cells migrating on lamini, but we also can observe them uh, in 3D. So Wills, a postdoc in the lab, imaged uh, these membrane tech GFP expressing mouse neural crest cells delaminating from the neural epithelium in vivo in a live E8.5 mouse embryo, and you can see nice lamnipodia protruding here. So the force uh, for lamnipodia protrusion is, uh, 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 comes from the polymerization of actin filaments directly underneath the plus membrane. And the main nucleator of actin filaments in lamnipodia is the R23 complex. And um, actin filaments can then be elongated, and um, they, this elongation this elongation is controlled by the inner vas protein family, which in vertebrates is composed of a vas mina evil. The R23 complex is activated by the Scarwave complex, a protein complex composed of five protein, HSBC300, wave AB, NAP1, and PIR121, SCAR1, and this is auto-inhibited in trans, and this auto-inhibition is relieved by three coincident signals. And this is RAC, PIP3, and phosphorylation. And this relieves the auto inhibition. And the VCA domain of wave proteins then able to bind and activate the R23 complex, leading to branched nucleation of actin filaments. In recent years, we have characterized the protein which we have termed lamnipodium because it localized to the very edge of lamnipodium and where it co localized with the SCAR wave complex. And, um, we have found out so far about lamnipodin that it functions downstream of growth factor receptors, the RAS and RAC effector, and also um, uh, function downstream of PF3 kinase signaling. And those two signals are required for its leading edge recruitment. The C terminus of lamnipodin is the business end, and it contains binding sites for direct interaction with the SCAR wave complex. And this interaction is promoted by uh, active RAC and c sarc phosphorylation of lamnipodin. And the interaction with lamnipodin with the scar wave complex is required for lamnipodin's function to promote neural crest and fibroblast migration. Uh, lamnipodin also co-localizes with inner vas proteins at the very edge of lamnipodia. 
and uh, also contains uh, binding sites for a direct interaction with Inavas proteins. And this um, interaction is promoted by the aid of phosphorylation of lamin protein. And um, this interaction is required for axon elongation and branching. And interaction with both SCAR-Wave and Inavas proteins is required for lamin protein's function to promote 3D migration invasion. Um, the Mullins lab showed that um, the cetums of lamnipodin contains binding sites for F-actin, and we found that um, lamnipodin also is able to recruit endophilin in fusis, mediates clathrin in and in cytosis, and the McMahon and Roku labs extended this work and found that uh, lamnipodin is, and endophilin is required for uh, clathrin independent and cytosis. Um, so, as I told you, lamnipodin localizes to the very edge of lamnipodia when they protrude and co-localizes there with um, inavas proteins, here shown in mcherry mina and the scar wave complex, shown in mcherry nap one And we wanted to um, characterize more proteins that would localize to the leading edge and uh, which also may regulate actin cytoskeleton. And we identified NHS lab one as a protein that localized to the very edge of lamnipodia, what can be seen here when you tack it either N or C terminal with GFP. And then in addition, it also localizes to these vesicles. So what is NHS like one? It's, it belongs to the uh, poorly characterized Nance-Rowan syndrome protein family, which is in vertebrates comprised of NHS, NHS like one and two. And um, mutations in the NHS gene cause the nance Horn syndrome, which is characterized by cataracts, facial abnormalities, and dental abnormalities, and metal retardation. NHS is more highly expressed in brain and thymus, uh, but NHS like one is ubiquitously expressed. So um, as you can see here, NHS like one and lamnipodin uh, both seem to uh, localize during lamnipodia protrusion to the very edge of lamnipodia. And not surprisingly, we also observed that NHS like one co-localized with the scar wave complex at the very edge of lamnipodia during protrusion. And this prompted us to test whether uh, the uh, NHS like one is interacts with the scar wave complex. And in this experiment, Annette, um, who transfected GFP tagged NHS like one with the entire MIP tagged scar wave complex. And um, after immunoprecipitation of NHS like one, observed co precipitation with the scar wave complex. We also observed endogenous uh, immunoprecipitation, co immunoprecipitation between NHS like one and wave two and AB, suggesting that indeed in cells NHS like one can interact with scar wave complex. Other than um, did a quite a detailed biochemical analysis of these interactions and due to time constraints, uh, I'll spare you all these details and summarize quite a lot of work in one sentence. And so Arle found that NHS log one directly interacts with the scar wave complex via the ABSH3 domain and two SH3 binding sites in NHS log one. So Arle then set out to characterize the function of NHS log one in cell migration. And to do this, she generated a CRISPR knockout cell lines using the B16F1 a melanoma cell line. And uh, she used the Nikkei's approach to reduce the chance for off-target effects and knocked in a stop codon into exon 2 and then characterized several cell lines. And one of them is the NHS like one CRISPR2 cell line, which represents a full knockout. And the CRISPR21 cell line represents a heterozygote uh, and not all alleles are knocked out. So when Arle then analyzed um, uh, random cell migration, when she played it then on fibronectin, she observed the NHS like one uh, knockout cells uh, seem to have longer cell tracks. And when she quantified cell migration speeds, she observed that the NHS like one knockout cells had significantly increased cell migration speeds, suggesting that NHS like one negatively regulates cell migration speed. This was surprising because previously we had found that lamnipodin uh, positive regulates cell migration. And as I told you, both lamnipodin and NHS like one uh, co-localize in protruding la lamnipodia at the leading edge. So um, that was quite surprising. So all I then uh, wanted to also analyze the uh, NHS like one functions in cell migration persistence. And um, 
so there are problems with measuring cell migration persistence in, in terms of accuracy of measurement. So uh, very often it's measured using a directionality ratio between the straight line distance from start of the finish to the finish of the track and uh, divided by the overall track length. And uh, this is confounded by different speeds of cells. And in this example from a paper from Alexis Gautreau's lab, this is exemplified. And so these orange cell and the blue cells both have um, the same directionality vectors, but they have different step sizes or speeds. And when you then look at the directionality ratio over time, you see this results in quite different directionality ratio um, uh, curves, even though they have the same directionality vectors. And if you then average for a whole population of cells, you get very noisy tracks and you can see how problematic it is to use the entire track. So basically last time point here for directionality ratios leading to inaccurate measurements. To overcome this, we're using a method origin developed by Graham Dunn at King's College, which we published together with Graham in 2013. And this is the Dunn persistence method. And in this method, we are also using a directionality ratio, but it's a directionality ratio over a short time interval. In our case, we choose 60 minutes, so basically four uh, intervals um, uh, of the movie. And, um, and then uh, we uh, calculate many, many of those uh, uh, directionality ratios over the entire track of the movie, and then average over those. This gives us the mean track persistence, overcome the traditional problems of measuring. And so when Arle did this, she observed significantly increased mean track persistence uh, for images like one knockout cells. And again, that is the opposite of what we had observed for the Mie so Arla then extended this with, together with an undergrad student, Ahmed, in the lab, in which she overexpressed NHS like one, either the wild type cDNA or cDNA in which she had mutated the uh, two ABSH3 domain binding sites, rendering it incapable of binding to the scar wave complex. And we refer to this as the NHS like one scar wave binding mutant. And we will use that for additional functional assays in this talk. So um, when Arle overexpressed these in B16 of one cells and then played them on fibronectin, she observed um, moderate but significant um, reduction in cell migration speeds only in the cells overexpressing wild type NHS like one, suggesting that NHS like one negatively relates cell migration via the SCARWAVE complex. Importantly, the um, NHS like one SCARWAVE bind mutant localized normally uh, like wild type to the very edge of Lampudia and, and to vesicles, suggesting that phenotype is not due to mislocalization. And this also suggests that NHS like one functions upstream of the scar wave complex. Then again, uh, together with uh, two PhD students in the lab, Sham and Tommy, uh, we extended uh, this uh, work further and uh, first they um, plated, uh, again, controlled cells and NHS like one knockout cells, this time on laminin, a substrate on which b 6 f one cells migrate much faster. But again, they could, uh, they obtained the same result that NHS like one knockout cells were significantly faster. They then attempted to rescue this uh, phenotype in the knockout cells by re-expressing of well, either wild type NHS like one or the scar wave binding mutant and observed that only when they overexpressed wild type, but not the scar wave by a mutant, they observed um, uh, that they could rescue this phenotype. And so um, ideally we wanted, since the scar wave complex is a major activator of the R2-3 complex in cells, ideally we wanted to measure R2-3 activity in cells uh, to see whether, uh, what the effect would be of loss of NHS like one on R2-3 activity, and there was no tool available. So we generated an R2-3 fat film biosensor, and um, this relies on the um, fact that the R2-3 complex undergoes a confirmation change of an activation, and we tagged two subunits of the R2-3 complex, one with the uh, fat donor and top 2 and one with the fat acceptor and venous, and then measured um, FRED by uh, FLIM. And um, uh, so first, we, as a proof of principle, uh, we um, transfected cells with the dominant active RAC and our biosensor 
And when Tommy and Ale analyze these cells, they observe that only in cells that overexpressed on the active frac had a significantly increased average cellular threat, suggesting that this biosensor faithfully reports atrophy activity in cells. So when they then analyze cells expressing uh, our NHS like one knockout cells expressing our biosensors, they also uh, observed in a significantly increased average cellular threat in our NHS like one knockout cells, suggesting that um, NHS LAP1 inhibits atrophy activity in cells. So another uh, readout, but a more indirect readout of atrophy activity is if you fix and stain cells with uh, antibodies against atrophy, and then um, measure uh, or the intensity of the atrophy complex or staining in the lamnipodium, and this can serve as an indirect measure of atrophy activity because the atrophy complex is, in, is activated at the very edge of Lamnipodia and then incorporated into the Lamnipodia affecting measure. And Tommy analyzed cells, or knockout cells, um, that were fixed in stains for up to three. He observed a significantly increase up to three intensity in the Lamnipodium, and this uh, coincided with a significantly increased um, affecting intensity in the Lamnipodia area suggesting that um, NHS like one inhibits optophy activity in the lamnipodium. So to extend this, um, we again uh, overexpressed either Walter NHS like one or the NHS like one scar wave binding mutant in V6 F1 cells. And this time we could uh, trans we transfected this with a tricystronic um, plasmid, also transfecting a co-transfecting live act GFT. And um, measured uh, life act intensity in the Lamipodia area as a readout for f -actine, in, uh, uh, f actine intensity. And so what we observed is that on the NHS like one wild type overexpressing cells had a significantly decreased um, uh, f actine intensity in the Lamipodium, suggesting that NHS like one reduces f actine polymerization by the scar wave complex in the Lamipodium. So uh, to quantify or explore the effect of this on Lamnipodia dynamics, we uh, uh, automatically quantified Lamnipodia dynamics using core MATLAB script kindly provided by Gaud and Stanusen. And so this MATLAB script uh, uh, allows us to um, automatically threshold GFP live act expressing cells and also then uh, basically quantifies um, or generates protrusion vectors at each pixel along the edge and from each frame to the next frame. We then um, modified this code and uh, coded add-on um, code to get quantitative measurements out and also in, so including um, uh, analysis of areas of protrusion and retraction along the leading edge. So first when we uh, just looked at these movies of wild type cells, we observed that they have very stable lamnipodia in general, but once in a while you see uh, vectors flipping backward, suggesting some uh, instability, uh, minor instabilities. So in contrast, when we analyzed the NHS type 1 overexpressing cells, we observed uh, very often that vectors would flip back and uh, suggesting that NHS like one reduces the stability of Lamnipodia protrusions. So we quantified this, uh, and one of the measurements we did was basically uh, to um, extract the information uh, of areas of protrusion and retractions, and one of the measurements was the longest, longest uninterrupted Lamnipodia length. In this case here, that this is uh, area here, this is the longest uh, uninterrupted Lamnipodia in this frame, but then we did this for each frame of the movie, average over all the frames, and um, from this analysis we found that uh, indeed the longest uninterrupted Lamnipodia link significantly reduced in cells overexpressing NHS lab 1. In addition, we also found that NHS lab 1 overexpression did not affect protrusion speed, but as I already said, it reduces Lamnipodia stability. When we then did the opposite, when we analyzed our NHS led by knockout cells, we rarely observed vectors flipping back. And um, when we quantified this, um, we observed that uh, a significant increase in the longest uninterrupted Lamnipodia length in the CRISPR-2 knockout cells 
Saying that, I should remind you that the CRISPR-21 cells are uh, heterozygous and uh, not a full knockout. And so in general, we, uh, we obtained um, similar results with the heterozygous CRISPR-21 cells, but this was phenotype was not always fully penetrated. So um, from this, we conclude that nhs led one knockout does not affect protrusion speed. So we are also obtained that result, but uh, it increases the Lamipodia stability. So to summarize what I've shown you today, I've shown you that nhs like one functions by inhibiting ARP2 free activity. By inhibiting ARP2 free activity, it reduces affecting content in Lamipodia. And um, thereby it reduces the stability of Lamipodia protrusions and hence reduces cell moderation via scar wave. So, um, of course, there's a lot more um, uh, data that supports this, and uh, we posted our manuscript on via archive for you to read if you're interested to read additional details. But uh, before I conclude, I wanted to um, try to um, uh, have a more global view on what that means. So, I already told you that we were puzzled by. Uh, the uh, finding that Lamipodium positively uh, versus NHS negatively regulates 2D cell migration via the scar wave complex, and yet both uh, co localized in protruding uh, Lamipodia. And so it's very known in biological circuits, uh, paradoxical components are very well known. And so, what are paradoxical components? they have two opposite effects on the same targets, and this is different from negative feedback loops. And so uh, one example of a paradoxical component is in what's called an incoherent feedforward loop. And depending on whether in the negative arm there's a delay or no, a delay, or no delay, this leads to a hemostasis of the system or pulse. And in the case of the lamipodium, this could mean uh, a stabilization of a protrusion or Lamipodium protrusion and retraction. And so uh, we want to propose a model here. Obviously, that's something we need to test uh, in the future that Lamipodium in NHS like one may constitute an incoherent feed forward loop to control the stability of Lamipodium to tightly control cell migration downstream of RAC. So I already uh, acknowledged all the people who did the work uh, uh, while I was giving the talk. Um, I just want to emphasize that uh, this would not have been possible without excellent collaboration with in King's College London. So with Simon Amar Bergslab, who helped with the Fred Flynn and Fred Flynn analysis, Brian Stramer's lab, who helped with the particle image velocimetry of acting retrograde flow that I didn't have time to show, and um, Karen Luce's lab for long standing collaboration on. Um, your quest migration the most, and I thank you for your attention. Thanks very much, Matthias. That's great. Everyone wants to unmute and give an applause. So any questions? Adam, you just muted yourself mid mid speech. Yep, I did. <laughs> <laughs> Got to get used to being back. So. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, any questions, please put them in the Zoom or YouTube chat. Um, we've got one from Claire Waterman on YouTube, who's asking, so what do you think the biological function of NHSL1, how do you think it relates to the human disease? Okay, yeah, so that's that's a good question. So, I mean, in general, it seems to be a, a set a negative regulator of cell migration. And so um, the, what's interesting is, uh, so first, uh, NHS like one, NHS and NHS like two, they are uh, related in part of family, but on the amino acid level, they are only conserved uh, at around 25 to 30%. So, and um, however, the uh, two uh, scar wave binding sites are highly conserved in, in all three family members. And so this could suggest that potentially for the Nancy Holmes syndrome um, that um, uh, this uh, that could be also basically is it could interact uh, directly via this interaction with the, the scar wave complex and uh, similarly may uh, the phenotype of um, maybe a new crest phenotype um, uh, for the Nancy Horn syndrome. 
And we have uh, actually another question from YouTube from, uh, I guess, Mitro um, says, cool talk. And are there any similar deformities linked with lamellipodin than with NHSL1? Um, well, so um, lamellipodin also is uh, what we, um, in collaboration with Roberto Mayo's lab, we published that basically lamellipodin is, um, uh, is required for neural crest migration. So it's positive regulator of neural crest migration. And so in this case, um, uh, so uh, there's a potential there that's also during neural crest migration. So in this case, it would be NHS potentially, which um, uh, work in opposition to lamellipodin. And what we have to think here is that uh, basically uh, going away from linear pathways, that basically there can be uh, positive negative regulators at the same time there as in a way as a real start and using basically these, all these circuits um, uh, like the paradoxical circuits that I mentioned and um, so that would be the idea how lamipodin may basically function in similar pathways uh, like NHS, or NHS like one. I have a, a question um, just for me. Sorry if I missed it. I was having some internet troubles actually um, in the middle of your talk, but I'm wondering, um, is this a, a, a protein that's expressed in, in many cell types or is it in any um, epithelial cells in particular? Yes, yeah, so I mean, and it's like one um, is uh, 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 ubiquitously expressed. Um, and there is, uh, uh, it's fully characterized. So for NHS, there I think there are two papers that suggest that it's basically it is in epithelial cells and also localizes uh, co-localizes. I think with CO1. Um, so I would expect that NHS like one is also in epithelial cells, but we uh, so far we haven't studied that in detail. But um, yes, it's most likely there as well. You said co-localized with CO1. Yeah. Oh, that's very interesting. Thanks. We have a question on Zoom from Shashi Singh. Uh, did you see a change in scar wave complex turnover in your uh, NHSL1 knockout? Um, scar wave complex turnover, that's an interesting question. Um, we have not in detail looked at that, but um, what we observed, uh, and we were as first puzzled by this, we observed a reduction in up to three uh, complex, um, uh, so overall up to three complex is reduced, and there's the paper suggesting that the up to is basically one explanation could be there's over constant over activation of the up to three complex may lead then to a proteasomal degradation of the up to three complex, and there's one paper that suggests that the up to three complex can be uh, degraded degraded by the proteasome. And um, so that's, that's quite a possibility also for the scar wave complex, but we haven't looked in detail. And that's something what we probably yes, should do and explore whether that's uh, also down regulated. A quick question from me, which is a follow up from Claire's question, which is uh, do you think this NHSL1, because it's inhibiting all of the kind of parameters that you expect from a, a nicely migrating cell? So do you think it's uh, modulating between exploratory versus directed behavior in vivo? Um, yeah, I mean, it's, well, it's a really good question. Um, so clearly, I think um, one of the main functions could be there that um, basically both NHS like one as well as lamnipodium, uh, lamnipodin modulate uh, lamnipodia stability. And this, you can envision that this is basically used for directional migration and exploratory behavior uh, to basically kind of like, depending on uh, uh, the direction of the signal that lamnipodium gets either stabilized or destabilized. And so that's something what we're exploring now. Great, thank you very much, Matthias. Uh, if anyone has any other questions, um, you can put them in the chat until the end or you can uh, post them in uh, the Slack channel. And Thanks so if you have again. any questions, you can also ask on Twitter. Thanks. So we go on to our second talk for today. Um, so our second speaker is Greg Emery. Uh, Greg is a professor in the Department of uh, Pathology and Cell Biology and a group leader in the 
Zika Trafficking and Cell Signaling Research Unit of IRRC at uh, University of Montreal. Uh, his research team mainly focuses on the cell biology aspects of collective cell migration in vivo and in cultured cells. And today he'll be talking about um, coordinating repulsive and contractile forces during collective cell migration. Okay, hi everyone. I hope you can hear me fine. I just said a warning that I had some unstable internet connection, so I hope I won't have too much trouble <laughs> during my presentation. Uh, so I would like to thank for the organizer. It's a, it has been a fantastic seminar series. You can track a, a silver lining on uh, these difficult times. And uh, today I would really like to tell you about a story about how we think collective cell migration is kind of like uh, um, coordinated among the different cells that migrate together. And this has been a work that was mainly uh, uh, done by two uh, very talented people in my lab. Not everyone is very talented in my lab, but uh, mainly uh, postdoc Cedric Plutoni and my research associate uh, Sarah Kay. And actually, at the end, I'm going to tell you a little bit about some unpublished work uh, that follow up that was done by Gabriela. So uh, collective cell migration, so uh, as you know, I mean, it's very important in development. And as uh, Matthias mentioned, I mean, we have different type of uh, migration that are involved in development, the formation of the pre-cellular organisms. And uh, this migration can be of very different types that can be uh, uh, from single uh, cells migrating alone to very large group of cells. And these are very critical for, for many different development uh, uh, features, as I mentioned, but also for the dissemination of cancers. And it's thought like that most of the cancers are to, so most of the metastasis are actually due to uh, the collective migration of uh, cancer cells from the primary tumors. And one mode of uh, migration that is uh, very prone to that is uh, migration in small groups and small clusters of cells that will keep uh, a strong um, cell cell junction together at the same time that they would be able to detach from the primary tumors and migrate through tissues. So in our group, what uh, we, we use as a model system is a border cell migration in uh, the Drosophila egg chambers. So Drosophila egg chambers are structures that are part of the ovaries. And in the ovaries, you have so-called ovarials that are series of egg chambers at different stages of development that are schematized here. And uh, the, the border cell migration uh, takes place between so-called stage nine and stage 10 that can be staged by the growth of the oocyte. And the cells uh, that migrate are the so-called follicular cells that uh, surround these cells that are inside, that is the oocyte and so-called nerve cells. And they so detach from this epithelium form a small cluster and invade in the tissue. And you can see an example here. So if the movie works, yes. So you have here in the chambers and you can see here the group of border cells that detach and start to migrate in between these uh, giant nerve cells. So the group of cells you may see uh, there is one cell at the tip that form protrusion. And that's a common feature to a lot of uh, uh, collective migration that there are leader cells, cells that would be at the front and where they would actively form protrusions, and there are follower cells that would more like contract on the back. Uh, and the hierarchy between the leader cells and the follower cell is really one of the key questions we would like to understand in our lab. And this is, as, as you can see here, really concerned in, in most of the collective cell migration that has been studied. In this case, one of the reasons why the leader cells making protrusion uh, is that it receives most of the signal that attract the group of cells. And this signal are uh, uh, ligand to receptor thiazine kinases that are secreted uh, near the nucleus of the oocyte that grows here, and that does attract the cluster uh, in the right direction. And the front cell here is probably the cell that receives more of the receptor thiazine kinase signals, and that will then in turn uh, lead to the activation of PRAC. But then there is a mechanism that uh, uh, basically tells to the other cells that they should not activate RAC and they should not protrude. And this is really what we would like to understand. So our understanding of how the cluster is basically moving is a bit like that. It's very naive, but the cluster is here in between these giant nerve cells and then receive the signal coming from this side here. And that will lead to the RAC activation in the little cell. And now that RAC activation, as I just mentioned, is going to shut down RAC activation in the other cells. So even if there would be ligands going around, 
that would not turn on RAC and that would not lead to protrusion. So then this leads in turn to the formation of a protrusion at the front. And this is what I would refer as uh, propulsive forces. I mean, it's formation of a protrusion front that will elongate the cluster forward in the direction of migration. But then you need to contract in order to uh, move forward. And then you would have a contractility that's going to be established at different position around the cluster. There would be patches of myosin-2 contractility at the back of the cluster. And, uh, and there would be also a, a activation of myosin-2, both at the basis of the protrusion and at the tip of the protrusion. That was shown by others in, in subculture, uh, for example, by uh, um, uh, Claire Waterman to be required for processivity at the level of the protrusions. So we think that this is going to generate the, this kind of forces, forces both at the back end of the cluster and at the level of the protrusion per se, and that's going to make the cluster move forward. So as I mentioned, one of the key questions is why is it only one cell that's protruded and not all the cells of the cluster? And we, a few years ago, uh, we found out a protein that may be involved in this process and that we decided to characterize in detail. And that protein is called moesin in Drosophila. It's the sole member of a family of proteins in mammals that is ezrin, radixin, moesin. So there are three of them in, in mammals. And uh, in brief, what moesin does is that when it's activated, it cross-links the actin cytoskeleton to the plasma membrane by binding both to filament act actin and by binding to phosphorinositide at the membrane. And this will uh, stiffen the cortex and, and, and basically rigidify the plasma membrane where there is active moiesin. And when we looked at the phosphorylated active form of moiesin, what we found is that it is at the periphery of the cluster. So here, if you have a cluster that would be in, in surrounded by the nerve cells, there would be very little or no phosphomoiesin at the junction between the border cells, cells themselves. But inside the border cell, but at the uh, basically junction with the nurse cell, there would be uh, a structure of, uh, of um, uh, activated moiesin that uh, we think uh, through also uh, a junctional protein, like cadherin, as Dennis Montel showed, would create a kind of a supracellular actin structure that will somehow uh, influence where uh, um, protrusions can be formed. And we know that this is the case because if we lose moiesin, like in a moiesin loss of function, or if we lost this uh, trafficking protein, RAB11, that was our entry point in the story, we have no phosphomoiesin anymore at the periphery of the cluster. And now each cell of the cluster can have high bracket activation and can form protrusions in opposite direction. And this would create this kind of propulsive forces in the opposite direction, and the sum of the forces would be null, and thus the cluster would not move. So <clears throat> at that point, we were curious about how moiesin is regulated. As I said, it has to be phosphorylated in order to be active at the periphery. And we found that RAB11 was somehow involved in the process. But RAB11 being no kinase, we thought that RAB11, which regulates transport, might act on the distribution of a moiesin kinase in the border cell cluster. And we made several predictions for this uh, moiesin kinase. We thought that it should be necessary for border cell migration, should be required for the phosphorylation of moiesin, and actually should directly phosphorylate moiesin, and uh, should be localized at the periphery of the cluster because that's where we find phosphomoiesin, and that should be through a rab mediated transport. <clears throat> and finally, it should be involved in the same process as moiesin, so it should restrict protrusion formation so that just the leader cells can protrude. So we did a small screen, an RNAi-based screen in uh, the, the border cell, so we can express RNAi specifically in the cluster. And we express RNAi's against the different T20 kinases because they are known to act on moiesin in most of the case. Um, uh, most of the known kinases, I would say, for moiesin are T20 kinases. And uh, among the uh, kinase we tested, like three had a very significant phenotype, like three was uh, characterized by others in other contexts, but two were quite interesting. Uh, one is tau, and I'm gonna come back to tau at the end of the presentation. And the other one here is, is shapen. And there I just want to actually, uh, 
apologize kind of that in Joseph Fila, the abbreviation of Nishipan is MSN. And for those who work on moisin in mammals, they will know that the abbreviation of moisin of the gene moisin is MSN in mammals. But unfortunately, it's the same abbreviation, but in the context of Joseph Fila, MSN is going to be for the kinase, and moisin is going to be abbreviated MOI if there is an, uh, an abbreviation of moisin instead. Okay, so when we look at these kinases, what we found is that mischiepen kind of reproduce what we expected for the moisin kinase. So when we deplete moisin, you see that the signal of phosphomoisin that normally is around the cluster is now gone. And we can quantify that. Uh, tau is also a little bit of an impact on moisin. The other uh, that we tested here had little or no impact. And we could show that in vitro, Moisin can uh, be phosphorylated by mischiepen. So when we purify mischiepen, it acts on uh, the activation loop of moisin. Actually, it acts on the precise uh, residues uh, that has to be phosphorylated with this creonine 556. So it seems that it is a moisin kinase, uh, and we could show that it is required for migration, basically. So is it at the periphery of the cluster, as we would expect for a moisin kinase? Yes, it is. So when we look at uh, this fusion of Nishipan with YFP, you can see that it is localized at the periphery of the cluster when the cluster is migrating. There's a little bit of uh, the protein at other junction. And uh, interestingly, there is some Nishipan in vesicles, which are possibly intermediate of transport from uh, some internal compartment back to the plasma membrane. Um, because we know that TRAB11 regulates transport from the recycling endosome back to the plasma membrane. That's what's making a lot of sense. So is that distribution uh, dependent on RAB11? Yes, it is, because when we express a dominant negative form of RAB11, now we completely lose the uh, midshipman that is at the periphery. Surprisingly, now midshipman is an internal uh, uh, junction, which we don't uh, really understand yet why. But the other thing which is interesting is that these intermediate of transport, these vesicles, are gone. So vesicles that goes from the recycling endosome back to the plasma membrane are usually labeled with a complex called the exocyst. So we wonder if these vesicles here would be positive for sec 15 which is one of these subunits of this complex. And, and yes, there are. So the midship and vesicles here are completely overlapping with a sec 15 there, suggesting that indeed these are intermediate of transport and indeed midship is transported uh, by RAB11 uh, at the periphery of the cluster. So that was another of the prediction we made for the kinase. The last one that we made is that the, uh, the kinase should be involved in the restriction of protrusion. So for that, we did here 3D reconstitution of the cluster. And you can see that in a controlled situation, you have one main protrusion at the front of the cluster. Sometimes you have smaller, short-lived protrusion on the side. But when you deplete mischiefen, you have multiple cells that will display uh, long protrusion that would emanate from different cells of the cluster. So indeed, there is a default in the restriction of protrusions, and now you have uh, multiple long protrusions that are formed. So Mishipan is really, looks like really the kinase we were looking at. It's necessary for border cell migration. It is required for the phosphorylation of moisin and can actually directly phosphorylate moisin. It is localized at the periphery of the cluster, and it restricts protrusion formation. But we had some unexpected findings uh, compared to what we knew from RAB11 and moisin. And this is illustrated in this movie here. So you have a control situation with a cluster with a protrusion that has some dynamics at the front that disappear and reappear. Uh, in the mischief and RNAi that is below, you see that you have very long protrusion that forms that are very stable and that usually doesn't disappear for quite a long time. On top of that, you see a detachment effect that was also unexpected. And we could quantify that. So we have multiple protrusions. We have 50% of the cluster that don't detach. And we have long and uh, stable protrusions. So detachment defect and long and stable protrusion were reminiscent of phenotype of abnormal contractility, as was shown, for example, by Jocelyn McDonough. So we looked at where uh, uh, contractility occurs in a cluster depleted from mischievous. So here you have the control situation when we look at phosphomycin light chain of fossil squash and Josephila, we see that it is present in patches at the back of the cluster that are usually quite symmetric, not always, but quite frequently. And you have this uh, uh, accumulation in the protrusions, as I mentioned, 
where you have accumulation of phosphomycin at, at the basis and at the tip of the protrusion. When we deplete misshapen, uh, uh, so the activity of uh, myosin is still there, the system phosphomycin light chain, but now it is disorganized. You have this long symmetric and linear accumulation on the side of the cluster, and you, have, uh, you don't have this very clear signature in the protrusion where the signal is much more diffuse and all along the uh, uh, protrusions. So we think that actually misshapen is somehow responsible to uh, localize and to restrict also like where myosin light chain is active. Uh, so myosin 2 is active in the cluster. So now we have misshapen doing two different things. On one hand, it regulates protrusion uh, uh, distribution, so where protrusion can form in a way, and at the same time, it regulates uh, where contractility occurs. So the next question we had is, is it doing everything through moesin, and that moesin then both uh, control the protrusions themselves and the dynamic at the cortex and in, uh, uh, protrusion, in, uh, yeah, in protrusions? Or is misshapen acting on moesin to restrict protrusions and on something else to act on the dynamic of the cortex protrusion and on detachment. And we, we, we expected kind of having the second case because we knew that when we deplete moesin or when we lose phosphomoisin, we didn't have effect on contractility. So to test that, what we did is to use Joseph tricks. Basically what we did is to deplete misshapen in the cluster and then complement by re-expressing different things. And one of the things we express is the phosphomimicking form of moesin. So if misshapen act purely on moesin, you would expect that all of the phenotype would be some, to a certain degree, uh, uh, rescued by the expression of the uh, phosphomimicking form of moesin. However, this was not the case. So when we express the phosphomimicking form of moesin, we restrict protrusion against to the front. But actually, the morphology and the time, uh, the, 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 the stability of the protrusion are still abnormal and the detachment is still uh, not occurring. So the cluster is still stuck there. So it looks like we have rescued what has to do with uh, uh, pro protrusion distribution, but not what has to do with contractility. So what next if we uh, increase contractility by expressing the rock catalytic, do the, the rock catalytic domain that's gonna uh, increase contractility, melting to mediated contractility. So what we see now is that the cluster is able to detach, uh, that protrusions have a normal morphology and a normal dynamics, but actually that we have still too many protrusions. So now to the opposite, what we see is that we have uh, too many protrusions, so we have no uh, restriction of protrusions, uh, but we have restored contractility. Uh, and these are quantification that we're gonna skip that goes wrong. So basically, this means that misshapen directly act on moesin, and this leads to a restriction of protrusion. We think for different reasons that I don't have time to introduce here that it goes through cortical tension to do that. Uh, on, in parallel, misshapen somehow act on myosin too, and we don't know if this is direct or if it's for work or for another regulator. And this will regulate uh, contractility uh, both at the level of protrusions and at the rest of the cortex to detach the cluster, et cetera. And so that was kind of unexpected that Nishipan would do these two things in a way. Uh, but it suggested you know, uh, that, that somehow Nishipan might be involved in the coordination of the formation of the protrusion and contractility. And, and this is what we wonder if Nishipan could, because it does regulate where the protrusion form and then the contractility, if it can somehow coordinate these events together. To test that, we use a tool that is uh, very similar to what Matthias introduced us, uh, but this is through this ADAPT plugin that was developed years ago by Matt Hall. And basically we delimit the periphery of the cluster and of, uh, in a, in a, a time-lapse recording. And we, measure we can measure different parameters and for the periphery. Here, what we measure is for each point at the periphery of the cluster, if at the next time frame, it will go toward the center of mass, or if it will go away from the center of mass. If it go toward the center of mass, we would consider that as a, a contraction or retraction. If it goes away, it would be an extension. 
and we can color code uh, uh, each point of the periphery dust for the speed at which it goes toward or away from the center of mass and represent that as a chemograph, basically where we cut the back of the cluster, uh, we linearize the cluster and we show all the time points linearly. So on this axis here, uh, on the X axis, you would have the time. And here you would have on the Y axis, different position of the cluster. You would have uh, this, the center, the front of the cluster that would be in the center and the back of the cluster would be split at the top and the back of the shaft. And what you see is, uh, and, and just uh, to be clear, the color code, this extension uh, goes up to the red and refraction to the blue. What you see is that at the front of the cluster, you have extension that occurs and that there's a certain rhythmicity in the extension that forms. And at the back of the cluster, you have contraction. And this seems to be kind of like timely occurring. And this is more evident if you sum all the speed of extension and all the speed of contraction at a single time point. And you would see that when the extension is the fastest, you have the fastest retraction. And it's almost always coordinated that when you have fast extension, you have fast uh, contraction, fast retraction at the same time. But this coordination is lost when we deplete Ms. Shepard. Now what we see is that we have moment where we have bursts of extension uh, in all the direction, by the way, but we have no contraction at the same time. And this seems to, this indicates to us that really the, con the coordination between protrusion extension and contractility is now lost. So basically, uh, what I showed you up till now is that mischief and act on moiazine to uh, restrict protrusion and act on myosin 2 to regulate contractility. And we think that both together would coordinate collective cell migration in, in the border cell cluster. So briefly, a couple of things to, to finish and to give you some hints of what we are looking at in the future. So one of the things is that we don't know how mischief and regulate contractility. But quite interestingly, you know, at the same time that we have this study, we, may, we publish another story on regulator of half GTPases. And what we found is, among other things, that a GEF for half named STEPK uh, uh, should be maintained low in terms of activity at the back of the cluster. And if it's too high, it would block uh, detachment and contractility. And interestingly, the autologue of STEPK, which is cytoase in mammals, is a target of the autologue of Ms. Shepan, which is map 4 k 4 So it could be that somehow this mechanism here is uh, also playing a role in regulating contractility uh, uh, at the back through Ms. Uh, 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 function. The other thing that we want to understand is what is upstream of Ms. Shippen. And the, the, the Ms. Shippen kinase per se is quite simple. It has a kinase domain and a CNH domain, citron homology domain. And within the kinase domain, there is a threonine, threonine 194, uh, that was shown to be phosphorylated to be activated by the kinase tau. And uh, this was shown by Tony Yip. And interestingly, if you remember, Tao was the second strongest hit of our screen and also had some impact on um, moisin phosphorylation. So we think that Tao might be upstream of this shipper. So the other region of interest is the CNH domain and the CNH domain are known to be able to bind to raw GTPases. And again, some GTPases, for example, CDC42 is being involved in cell cell communication to block uh, protrusions formation. It has also been able to bind to RAP GTPases, well, uh, RAP2 in mammals, uh, namely, but RAP1 has been shown to regulate also protrusion by Anya, uh, uh, Anna Young and to regulate contra contractility by Justin McDonough. So it could be interesting to see if somehow a raw GTPases might interfere with the CNH domain to recruit or activate Ms. Shipper. And briefly to show you uh, 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 what we have gotten so far on, on this point, uh, if we deplete or in this, or what, what you show here, if we use mutant of ta, tau, what we see is a phenotype that really mimics the misshapen and phenotype. Uh, basically, we have extra, pro, extra long protrusion, too many protrusions, and we have a detachment before. And this occurs even if not all the cells of the cluster are mutant, but just uh, more than 50% of the cells, suggesting that really a cell cell communication me a mechanism has been disrupted there. And if indeed tau act on Ms. Shippen, we would expect that uh, re-expression of Ms. Shippen in a tau loss of function would uh, res rescue the phenotype. So if you look on the right part here of the chart here, when we deplete tau, uh, we have uh, almost 75% of the cluster that don't migrate at all. 
Uh, this is slightly increased if we express a kinase instead of misshapen, uh, but uh, uh, as expected, it is risky if we uh, overexpress misshapen in this background, and even better if we express a phosphomimicking form of misshapen. So, um, so this really uh, uh, suggests that actually um, uh, misshapen is regulated and activated by tau. Uh, next thing is the raw GTPs and it's unwrap, and I'm going to go very, very briefly on, on that. But basically, uh, as I mentioned to you, misshapen is usually at the periphery. It's a bit less obvious at the beginning of migration. Uh, but when we perturb the activity of several GTPs, CDC42, RAP, or RAW, we have a relocalization. And this is very preliminary, but it suggests that uh, GTPs indeed may have an impact on the localization of misshapen, and now we want to see if there is a direct interaction between these proteins. So basically to wrap up, I showed you the role of misshapen, and now we think that we have at least three ways of regulating misshapen activity. One is through the kinase tau that may activate misshapen in the process. One I showed you is for RAB11 that localizes the overall distribution of misshapen. And we think another possibility is that it might be regulated by uh, GTP is at the row and the RAP family, possibly to recruit misshapen uh, at the cortex. And I already thank the main people involved in the, in the, in the project. I just want to uh, mention also that the initial work on RAP11 and Moisin was a collaboration with Denis Montel, and the Moisin misshapen work was a collaboration with uh, Sebastian Carano and uh, Philippe Roux. And I'm going to stop here and thank you for your attention. Thanks very much. We can go on to the questions. Uh, so first one from Robert Insull. Um, is it, I guess is it, it is misshapen, so is misshapen controlling scar wave turnover? Uh, this we haven't looked uh, in uh, border cells actually, and, and we haven't, we, we have been starting to work a bit on the autolog in mammals, and we haven't really looked neither, but what we've seen is that the retrograde acting flow seems to be uh, affected and slowed down when you put your misshapen, uh, uh, the misshapen autolog, which is not for HIFO in mammals, but, but in flies we don't know. It would be a shame to look at the retrograde flow without looking at what sits upstream of the retrograde flow. Yeah, definitely. That was very preliminary work. Uh, and, and, you know, MAPOK4 does uh, uh, impact on the stability of uh, focal adhesions and many different things. So, I mean, this is super preliminary, indeed. Okay, thanks, Greg. Great talk. Um, Matthias uh, asks, do you think the activity of misshapen in the follower cells is controlled by the leader cell? And if yes, how? Oh. <laughs> okay, that's another thing we don't really know. Um, no, I, I don't know how it would, uh, yeah, I don't know how it would be the case. I think, I think that, you know, this, our idea of the supracellular structure is that it has to be there all around the cluster in, in all the cells and connect the cells together somehow to give a kind of a frame on which forces can, can apply and, and be applied. So I, I guess that uh, uh, misshapen would be somehow active everywhere, possibly less in the front to promote the formation of the protrusions there. Uh, but I, I'm, yeah, I, I don't know how it, yeah. I mean, but we don't know how this mechanism of, of uh, you know, inhibition of frac on the other cells uh, is working on. And it could be that there is indeed a communication from the front to the back. How this would impact on misshapen activity it's hard to tell, could be for the raw GTPases, but somehow we don't have an answer for that now. Uh, you kind of touched upon this, but it's a combination of questions from Ankita Ja and Hamid Badmas asking about what, what regulates misshapen activity and localization, for example, receptors or G proteins, and whether there are any phosphatases that are acting in reverse to misshapen. Yeah, so again, like the, the well, the localization, we think it goes through uh, RAB11, one of the things, but can be indirect. So RAB11, we know it's localized, for example, CDC42, and the distribution of CDC42 is almost identical to the localization of misshapen. So it could be that actually 
what RAV11 mainly drives as a localization is CDC42. And along that, uh, uh, through the CNH domain, midshipmen would be recruited to where basically CDC42 is localized. So, so that's how I see it happening, but obviously we still have a lot of work to do on, on that side. For the phosphatases, that's something we've been looking at also. I mean, we've done a screen on phosphatases. Uh, the difficulties is that we had several phosphatases that were uh, kind of like increasing the amount of phosphomoiesin that we would see, uh, especially uh, that we would see at the junction in between border cells, because as I mentioned, phosphomoiesin is restricted to the periphery of the cluster. But when we depleted some of these phosphatases, we had too much phosphomoiesin now inside the cluster also. And so, so that's interesting, but we don't know which one is direct. If the, since also mischiepen is directly phosphorated, could it be that also some acting on mischiepen to shut down, uh, because yeah, to shut down mischiepen in some regions or not. So these are the things we, we don't know yet, but definitely we think there are uh, phosphatases involved. Thanks. Uh, from near Gov, we have, why does the decrease in moisten uh, induce protrusions to grow from all the border cells as opposed to only the leader border cell in the normal case? Yeah, um, we, uh, again, this is a bit hard to, to, to know, but one thing that is known is that moisin main function is to increase stiffness at the cortex. And, and we looked actually at stiffness through indirect means because we don't have access to the cluster to, to do uh, things like atomic force microscopy and things like that. So what we looked is at the morphology of the cluster. Uh, we use the same ADAPT plugin. Maybe I can just show an image here. Uh, yeah, this is like the idea is that if you increase stiffness, uh, you would, so if you reduce stiffness, you would have more change of, of direction at the, at the membrane. If stiffness is increased, it would be more regular and, and kind of like spherical. And basically, if you use the same plugin as before, if we look in a controlled situation, we have a lot of this, uh, and we look at uh, uh, curvature, in certain is curvature, we have a lot of this greenish, uh, 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 yellowish area here that are low positive angles. And in controlled situation, you have usually one uh, region where you have a negative, a positive, and a negative curvature. And this is a protrusion. Protrusion will be first a negative curvature, then a positive, then a negative curvature. If we deplete Miss Shippen, you see that this is mainly a mess. And we have a lot of very dramatic uh, curvature changes that uh, suggest to us that rigidity, uh, that, that stiffness is actually reduced in the cluster. And, and the same like sphericity is reduced and that goes along. So, so we think that somehow, if it's more stiff and rigid, it's harder to form a protrusion. And that would involve, so moisin per se, and, uh, um, in, in, and, and the other thing that it may involve, and that uh, is uh, 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 similar to what was observed by, uh, by Denis Montel, by Guillaume Chen, is that uh, you would need also maybe contractility to increase stiffness and, and rigidity at the periphery. And they show that indeed contractility seems to be involved in restriction of protrusion at the same time. So we need both. We need the stiffness and contractility to block protrusion formation. I hope that's the, the question. I think that leads nicely onto um, a question from George Skitter, who says, hi, Greg, it's very nice to see you here. Uh, what, what is the extent of confinement of border cells? Do they move under compressive forces? And is the RAB11 mediated delivery of misshapen by membrane trafficking sufficient for its spatial restriction? Or are there anchoring points on the plasma membrane? Yeah, for the second part, again, we don't, we don't really no. Again, my guess is that the GTPases are going to play a role there to recruit into specific areas. Maybe RAP1 would be more at the back to uh, regulate detachment and, and, and CC42 might be at other places. Uh, for the, the rest, the, the, the architecture of the tissue is something that really interests us. We haven't looked much at it. Uh, just in McDonald play a bit with the tension from the nerve cells that plays on the border cells cluster and that influences the morphology and also like the dynamic of some, some of the structure there. Uh, interestingly, what we've seen also is that uh, when we look at protrusion formation, they preferentially would go at tricellular junctions. And we don't know exactly why we think that there is a little bit more space there to go. And also like most of the protein uh, that form uh, the tricellular junctions are not expressed at the early stage of border cell development, as was uh, shown by uh, Stefan actually uh, quite recently. So that would kind of sense, make sense that to keep the tricellular junction open to favor the, the progression of the protrusions there. 
And that might also help driving the water cell into the right direction because um, the, 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 there is a little bit more space in between the nurse cell in the center of the, the tissue actually. Uh, maybe that's where the cluster would preferentially go anywhere. Thanks. Uh, we have a question from Anna Pasapera. Could misshapen regulate myosin-2 activity within the border cell cluster through localized inhibition of PAR1 activity or directly inhibiting myosin phosphatase? Yeah, well, this, this um, so myosin phosphatase and PAR1 were shown by Jocelyn McDonald to really uh, involve where contractility occurs. And uh, from what we've been looking at, no, we didn't see any direct evidence link on that. And also the other thing is that when we looked at myosin-2, we didn't saw a change of the level of activity of when we did phosphomycin uh, light chain staining. The level of activity seems to be normal. So the degree of activity is normal. It's just where it is active that seems to change. Uh, and, and how does this occur really? Like we, we don't know yet. Um, but but uh, one possibility could be cytoazine. Again, we, we, we're not sure at this stage. Uh, it's too early to know. Thanks. A uh, question from Yutaka, who says, misshapen and its downstream junk cascades are working in other types of leader cells in collective migration, like epithelia edge during dorsal closure. Can you draw a parallel between these two types of collective migrations, although the thick atomycin bundle in the dorsal closure edge does not exist in the border cell leader? Yeah. Uh, the, the... <laughs> uh, it's a bit, yeah, I don't know exactly how it would work. Uh, I, I would have to look back in the dorsal closure. I haven't read these articles for quite a long time. Uh, but the, the migration there is quite different in the sense that you have a whole range of cells that are leader cells and the rest that is uh, uh, below. And uh, uh, I think also like the additions are very different. And actually there's much more addition to the matrix. And what is interesting with map 4 k 4 which is uh, the autolog of mischief and that really regulates the turnover of focal adhesion, so the interaction with the extracellular matrix. And, and in the case of border cell migration, there's very few, if any, uh, interaction with the extracellular matrix that is involved. It's all e cadering based interaction, which I should have mentioned later. So, so I'm not sure it's exactly the same. But obviously that's something interesting. And that's, that's one of the reasons why we wanted to study the autolog of uh, Michipa now in, in cell culture. And we look at a bit at epithelial cell in cell culture. And we, we have some indication that there might be indeed some uh, role also in, in the leader follower hierarchy, but it's still quite vague at that stage. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, a lot of very good questions. Um, very, very interesting. <laughs> we have a couple more. Uh, so yeah. Lada de Wind um, asks, do tau and misshapen also play a role in single cell migration? If, what, if uh, misshapen and what? Tau, do tau and misshapen also play a role in single cell migration? Well, misshapen, yeah. I mean, tau, tau I, I don't know much. My, tau, tau is complicated. It's involved with a lot of things. And even map 4 k 4 they're also involved in the hippo pathway. And, and uh, um, so I would expect, yes, uh, we haven't really played with it. And, uh, but it's known, uh, for, for sure, misshapen is known to be involved in a lot of, thing, a lot of cell migration uh, uh, cases. And, and I'm quite confident it's also in single cell migration. Again, if we perturb the, the, one of the autolog, there's three autolog in mammals, it's MIG1, TMIG, and map 4 k 4 If we perturb map 4 k 4 uh, we, we completely can approach the turnover of, uh, of, um, um, of uh, ah, <laughs> focal addition, sorry. And, uh, and thus the, the, the cell is completely uh, blocked. And, and if we look at small cluster of cells in culture, the same, they're, they're going to spread and they're not going to be able to direct anymore because all the cells are spread and are going to have stable focal additions. So, so I'm absolutely convinced for mischief and that's going to be involved in like almost Oh, uh, so Michigan or map it's going to be involved in more, all the type of migration. For Tau, I know less about what has been done and shown, but my expectation is that it's going to affect also a lot of migration. Again, also there is a lot, there's more redundancy for Tau. There is that, I think three or even four Tau kinase in mammals. So it might be a bit harder to, to uh, study them in mammals, but that would be definitely something interesting. 
Yes, the final question for today is uh, another one from George Oskita, who asked, what is the dynamics of cell nuclei during border cell migration? Do they rotate? Uh, what is their position in the leader versus follower? Yeah, I, I don't think anyone really look at the dynamic of the nuclei per se. Do they really like uh, uh, move on themselves or whatever? Uh, I, I don't know if we have, well, we probably have now the, the resolution to do that, especially uh, if someone would bring it to a, a lattice like sheet microscopy or something like that. Uh, we, even with point scanning microscopy, I think we could be able to look at that, but we haven't, I don't know if anyone that has done that. One thing that is clear is actually that the cell can exchange position. I mean, they're not always the same cell that's going to be at the front. So if you look at all the nuclei per se, you're going to see them like mixing, especially since I, I simplify that, but the cluster, what it does is usually detach, migrate, and then it's, it stops a little bit and, and kind of start to turn on itself and start to reestablish now a new polarity into a new direction. And, and at that stage there, they're going to be exchange of position. But does the nuclei rotate on themselves per se or what? I, I don't know. And how are they affected also by the, the constraint of the tissue? Something I, I don't know. That would be very interesting. Great. So thank you very much again, Greg, for that talk. Well, thanks, uh, everyone. And Jennifer, if you want to stop the YouTube, I've saved the